All right. So we will, let's go ahead and get started with the program. Sound like a good thing to do? I think so. So welcome everybody to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences Bug Fest, sponsored by Terminex and BASF. My name is Chris Smith. I'm curator for the SCCU Daily Planet Theater at the museum, and I am here to be uh, your host a little bit and help just guide the program along. And once we finish up the presentation, I'll help moderate questions from the chat box. So if you're taking a look at the controls available to you here on Zoom, if this is not your first time here, you can open up the chat box and there you can leave thoughts, questions, comments, insights of your own. For example, like what your favorite fact that you've learned at Bugfest is so far. And then from there, I'll be able to pose those to today's very special guests. We also have other museum staff on the call who can help out. So if something's not working for you, type it up there in the chat if you can, and we'll do our best to troubleshoot via the text options that we have available in the chat. Um, so Carrie, Jesse, Hugo, they're all here to help out. Uh, you have a few other options available to you as well. Up in the top right, you should have a button that says view or gallery or speaker view. Feel free to use those as you can. Right now, for example, I'm spotlighted, so you see me. But later on, when we have more guests speaking, you'll be able to change up the views a little bit. That can make it more uh, amenable to you and more accessible for you. Let me introduce today's very special guests. So first off, I want you to meet Alexi Gamby. He's the writer, director, and scientist behind The Fly Room. Welcome, Alexi. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. And then we have Adrian Smith, who is the scientist and filmmaker with us, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. He's the head of the Evolutionary Biology and Behavior Lab. And you might know Adrian from his work on YouTube at the Ant Lab channel. Adrian, Hi. welcome. Hey, Chris. How's it going? I'm doing pretty good. I'm having good. a great bug fest. How about you? Good. You have a bunch of uh, non-insect arthropods in your desk, but I don't see any insect-like things. Well, okay. So I have, okay. So this guy, uh, my centipede here is the biggest one, sure. But I have stag beetles and ants. Oh, okay. They're just tiny. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. All right. I tried. Okay. Just making sure. I did my, I don't have any flies. There was one buzzing around me yesterday during the show, but mm. uh, that one has departed. So, so we're all good there. So um, Adrian, do you want to take it away and Alexi? Yeah, let's do it. Um, Alexi, thanks so much for doing this. I'm, I'm really excited to, to talk to you and to chat uh, about this stuff. Um, so for everybody here, if you haven't um, checked out uh, the entire world which Alexi has built in science filmmaking. Uh, I'm going to post a link right now in the chat of Labusini, and you should go there and check out everything there. You can, you can, three dollars a month, you can subscribe to it and you can see all of his films and all of the films from the Imagine Science Film Festival series, which is now over 10 years. Is it like 12, 13? This will be the 13th year actually in October. Yeah, amazing. So check out his stuff and for sure check out that um, that whole sort of um, world of, of science and, and film that's that's on that site. Uh, it's fantastic. Okay, so um, I, I have so much I want to talk to you about, Alexi. Uh, maybe let's start with the fly room since um, uh, the theme of Bugfest is flies. Uh, the fly rooms is now like it came out six, seven years ago. Yeah, the fly room was uh, came out in 2000 and um, yeah, something like this, 2013, 14. But it it took about 10 years to make, 10 years in the making. So, um, so it was yeah, it was a long, long process to bring it to the many many short films and uh, and different iterations before we could actually make the feature film. So, but yeah, it came out in cinemas and um, in festivals in 2013 and in 2014 we were able to go around um many fly labs uh around the world um you know both film festivals and also 
universities um, showed it. It was it was wonderful. There's a lot, as Chris was saying, the the Drosophila fruit fly community is is very very big. So we we had over about a hundred countries that we showed it. So yeah, and and prepping for this, I'm just doing deep dives into into what you do and and all your stuff. And two of the things that I watched um, were. Um, two of the many things I watched were a fruit fly in New York and yeah. also a daughter of genetics. Yeah. And it, it struck me like watching those and then thinking about the fly room is like a fruit fly in New York is, was, correct me if I'm wrong, basically, was that your first film? It was actually, yeah, it was, it was one of my first um, documentary films. I was a, probably a f second year PhD student at Rock right. University. And I, and I started, I mean, I come from a background, my, my, both my parents are, my mom's a filmmaker, my dad's a painter. So I, I started dabbling in making, I was making short films, um, but it took me a while to start making those films. So that was one of the first films that I made when I was, you know, I would take evening classes in film in New York city. And I, um, and I, and I made a fruit fly in New York. It was kind of like my story as, as a fruit fly scientist, um, you know, bringing cameras and, and filming myself in the laboratory. So. Yeah, so, so like watching that and, and then all the way uh, into however many years later, uh, you were interviewing um, Betsy, which is who basically is the subject of your film and the daughter of the, the second, um, the geneticist, Calvin Bridges. Um, it's it, and one of the things I've heard you say is that um, is that you don't think of sort of your work as it, it you think of sort of the rigor involved in science and then and then applying equal amounts maybe even more rigor to to the the art that comes out of that and is sort of a product of that and watching these two things it's like those those two things were steps on the way to to the fly room. And I wonder if, if you think about the fly room now and you think it's like the sort of almost like the capitulation of, of your PhD. Is it like, do you view it like as a chapter of your dissertation? Like, yeah, that, it's interesting I, you mentioned that. I, I do definitely consider um, the fly room and, and most of my work actually, um, you know, I, I don't only make science films. I mean, I, actually working on a film on butterflies right now, which is also not a fly, but, mm -hmm. um, but the, but yeah, the fly room was very much of a, a kind of like closing the chapter or closing the cycle, the, the fly cycle, if you want, on my PhD and also film school, because I went to film school. I went to NYU film school right afterwards. Immediate, actually, I even had a one year overlap between, I defended my PhD after being at NYU for a year, but there's a lot of things in the fly room that were, were also kind of part research, you know, like the film, the, the bithorax, this four winged fly, and also the, you know, the, it, it definitely felt more than just a film. It was definitely an extension to, to my years in, in, the, in the lab and also kind of being able to say goodbye to that world because I actually ended up not, you know, pursuing a career in, in, in research. Um, so I was kind of like, it was kind of like closure to my right. years as a researcher and, and kind of then went on to to be a, a filmmaker so yeah well i mean one of the things i get from watching it is like i don't i'm not sure anybody else could have made that movie because i mean i mean you spending so much time like in a fruit fly research lab and and knowing about this story but then you know approaching your the the real life subject i mean i, I don't i don't know how you first reached out to her but I assume part of the conversation was like, I'm, I'm a fruit fly researcher and, you know, I, my work is, is a direct descendant of your father's work, but I'm really also interested in the story of, of people or, or whatever behind the science. And, and I'd like to, you know, think about uh, telling this story through film. Like it, to me, it's just a remarkable thing that, that it, that this movie exists and that, it, I feel like, yeah, I just feel like you're, you, you were the perfect position to, to make it and, and just the confluence of, of your background in science, but also your artistic aspirations and you're, you're going off, you're, you're 
work in the field of film. It's really came together in like a piece of, of art that's like truly yours and, and kind of, I don't know, kind of stands on its own, I guess. Well, thank you. it's very kind of you. I mean, it's kind of like a, like a, a child of mine. I always consider the fly room to be like my, you know, my, at this point, like my six year old, whatever child. But yeah, I, I, when I approached, I mean, anytime I, you know, at, the, at that time, I was still trying to carve my, you know, artistic slash scientific voice. I, I was trying, I was still tiptoeing around how I wanted to tell stories. I, I initially heard about the fly room in a genetics class. Uh, that was tar taught by um, a geneticist, Norton Zinder, who's also a very big uh, scientist. And, and I was very intrigued by this idea of scientists that were known as the flyboys, speaking of flies, you know, they were communists, they lived in the 20s in New York City, they were all kind of like, um, you know, kind of these like very kind of renaissance, like men, they would go to speakeasies, they were interacting with artists at the time, they they hung out in speakeasies and artists. And, and so I just became fascinated about that, that world that led to the first Nobel Prize in, in, in genetics. And so, and the fact that they never received the Nobel Prize, but they, you know, so there were all these stories. And as I was doing research, I discovered, I was, uh, you know, obsessively doing research about it and reading a lot of biographies, but I knew that I needed some sort of anchor into the, I was looking for people that had been to the fly room. Um, and I had met a few people that had, you know, been somewhat, you know, or connected to some of the scientists. But through the research, I discovered that his, the daughter of Calvin Bridges, who was my the character that I really wanted to focus on, because he was kind of a James Dean looking, you know, he had like this amazing hairstyle and, you know, was, was kind of a womanizer and, and known as being a womanizer. But when I discovered that his daughter was still alive, I immediately reached out to her and as you said, I, I, what you said is, is accurate. I introduced myself as a, as a fruit fly scientist interested in making a film. She, you know, I basically spent five years interviewing her and she didn't really want to speak about her father because there's a lot of issues with her father and, you know, uh, which is mentioned in the film. And mm -hmm. so it took a lot of time for me to become part of the family, actually. I, I you know, I, she would call me up and say, when are you coming? To visit me and it was only after maybe three or four visits that she would open up more and and one day it was probably three or four visits in over four years she told me that she went to the fly room when she was 10 years old and that was my anchor to the story it was like this little girl spending she she sort of said it tangentially in a conversation she's like oh yeah i went once i was 10 he showed me around he you know he held me and he showed me the by, and she started mentioning flies like by thorax, curly wing. And so that's when I realized that she actually, not only she connected with her father in that experience, but she knew much more about genetics than she, she was, she would tell me, you know, I don't understand anything about it, but then she would give me very elaborate conversation. So there was almost like a, her not wanting to admit that she didn't know about genetics was also a way of her nodding, not kind of associating herself to her father. So genetics was associated to her father. And I thought that was a really interesting angle to, to tell the story of the fly room because I wasn't interested in, in making a historical film about it. And there was also a film made, there, were, there have been a few documentaries made about the history of genetics. So, so that's the story with Betsy and uh, we were very close and she was part of the casting process, part of this, deciding who the daughter would, who would play her. I, I had access to her photos. Um, and there was many stories that, you know, of course it's dramatized and it's fictionalized, but I tried to encapsulate as many stories as possible within, you know, the film takes place over two days, basically. Um, and I try to include as many different stories in, into it as possible. So. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so, so like, um, it sounds like the journey to the fly room kind of started when you were uh, sort of still a PhD, getting your PhD at Rockefeller. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and then and then went through went through your time at, at NYU Tisch. Yeah. Right. Um, it, and yeah, I'm wondering. 
do you think there would ever be a world where where I mean, so I've I've read about you know video making and and your thoughts about sort of not thinking of of scientists making film as as outreach, but like an active extension of their research, mm -hmm. or or sort of you know putting 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 a, a amount of effort into sort of uh, thinking about actually making video or making film as much as you would doing a, a research project, and I wonder if there's if if there would, you know, if, if it was the times or if, if you see the world now as a way where, where you would, you would be doing research and also making films, uh, or, you know, it seems like you're on the path of, of making films, uh, although you are teaching at, at NYU Abu Dhabi and in biology, but are you, are you doing research or, or? Well, I actually, I teach in Abu Dhabi. I also teach in New York. I teach at Tisch and, um, uh -huh. Also teach I teach and because NYU has several uh, campuses but I, I actually have a double appointment in the biology department and in the film department so mm -hmm. um, but yeah I mean to, to your question about I mean the, 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 the term science communication has always been relatively problematic to me because it suggests that scientists are not necessarily good communicators. And so we need to organize events around the communication of science. And of course, especially now with everything that's happening with the pandemic, you know, science communication is important, but, um, but I feel, yeah, I feel that making films um, is in a way the same as writing an article that scientists should be equipped with the language of not only the technical aspect of video making, but how do you tell stories with, with visuals? You know, how do you, um, and how do you also take ownership over your own images? Uh, because oftentimes scientists are considered to be advisors or they advise on projects, which is absolutely fine. And that should be encouraged and, and continued. But I also think scientists should make films, should take their data and think, and I know you do that, you know, yourself, you, you make films. And so I think whether it's, you know, making documentary, and I, I think there, there should also be freedom in terms of how you want to use that footage. Maybe you want to make fiction, maybe you want to make um, animation, or maybe you just want to show the data without any. Um, so I think there, there's definitely a, a necessity for visual literacy. Um, the same way as a scientist needs to learn how to write, um, video is becoming such an important way in which we share data now because you go to conferences, there's no longer, I mean, there are posters, but there's now digital displays. There's, there's just a lot more video used as a unit of of, of kind of data, basically. It's not yeah. only about communicating, it's actually, we record research as video. You know, we do time lapses, we do simulations. And so um, how do you take that information and how do you tell stories with it? I think, I think it's uh, cr critical, um, you know, and of course, when I started, I received, there's a lot of resistance, right? From science communi community, but also from the film community as well, you know, uh, less now, I think it's becoming more, um, you know, these kind of hybrid worlds is becoming more kind of accepting. But, you know, at the time when I was applying to film schools, it was very difficult to explain to people, you know, they, they couldn't quite comprehend or wrap their heads around the scientists uh, becoming a filmmaker. They, was that part of your application? What, what, did, you, did you kind of pitch yourself as, a, as a wanting to do ex sort of experimental science? Film. Yeah, I, I did. I did. I, I also didn't want to box myself into that world. I, I, I knew the, the dangers of referring to myself as like, I want to make science content. But yeah, I, I told them that most of my, my curiosity about making film stemmed from science and especially mm -hmm. from the use of microscopes and, and flies because that was like my, my main um, model organism and so yeah and I but I had made other short films that had nothing to do with my research and and NYU was was pretty accepting of that I, there was other schools in on the west coast that didn't didn't you know respond as positively to it but uh, but NYU was interesting because everybody in my program there was about 35 of us we all had different backgrounds it was lawyers and writers and um, there were everybody came from a different different kind of, you know, it was almost like all of these people that wanted to make films, but that had like a, a past life as, as something else. So I felt quite at home there. Of course, you enter into the film world, which also is filled with a lot of illusions. And, um, but it, it, it was, 
it was it was great and i i had spike lee was a was a very big um part of the fly room he really he gave me a grant he was very very into the story about this little girl and and betsy and so it was really remarkable to see the enthusiasm about a film like that from you know from established filmmakers in, in that community so yeah i i wonder um uh I, I wonder in your experience in in film school, um, was there anything about about your science background that that you saw as like a as like a similar drive, similar sort of like um, I don't know, like uh, like creative force that is behind the work of a scientist and behind the work of an artist? Because uh, when me for me when I when I make a video, I'm I I want to do something that no one's done before, and I, I want to like capture something or tell a story or show something in a way that hasn't been shown before, and that's very important for me. Both, I mean, that's a like fundamental thing in science. Otherwise, like, why do it? But for me, that 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 sort of desire is transferred over to also like video video making. Is that I d I don't want to put something in the world that someone else could have done. Yeah. Both both like if it's me on screen presenting, but also like what I'm capturing and what I'm trying to say about whatever, you know? Yeah. I, I wonder if, if things like that popped up in your experience of- Absolutely, of I, I think the, the, the research kind of, uh, the research prep and the research experience that I had is, is very similar to making films. In, in many ways, I feel like those two worlds are, are very similar. The way in which you kind of build, I mean, whether it's a short video or whether it's a feature film, how do you take these individual experiments? Um, you know, sometimes we think of film actually as being very, there's almost like a linear way of doing it. You write a script, you shoot, you know, you write a script and then you're in pre-production, you raise financing, you make the film. But in my way of working is that I, I make all of these small experiments. I make small videos like A Fruit Fly in New York and um, I made a short version of The Fly Room with, with the same actress. Um, and then I go back to the writing and I go, you know, and then there are things that I take, it's kind of like a, like a, like a melting pot of different things. And in many ways I treat it as research. And of course, if I'm in, if I'm doing a, a film about a science, specific science topic, there's a lot of research that goes into understanding the field, you know, um, how they would speak at the time, you know, they wouldn't refer to it as, as genes, but they would refer to like, you know, these elements as factors and, um, so there's a lot of things that go into it and it's, it's, yeah, my, you know, my research experience in many ways, um, informed a lot of how I make films and how I teach film as well. Um, and I also teach biology, I teach cell biology and I teach a class on visual cognition, but I use film as a way to teach concepts. I have students make films and then they have to present the, the videos that they make and be able to speak about, you know, apoptosis or speak about cell division through the, through the films that they make. Um, and it's an interesting process because, because they've made the films, they have, to, they, they have to almost take ownership over the research, but also the, the, the film that they make because they are the directors. And so they become experts about speaking about certain scientific topics through, the, through that process. And um, so, yeah, I, I think there's a lot, there's a lot in common to those two worlds. And it's also, you know, it's like basic research. You, you never see the end to making a film. I mean, I'm working on this Monarch Butterfly movie right now. And it's, I mean, it's like seven years and it, like it never ends. You know, right now I'm at the last phase of color correction and, you know, and all that stuff. But it's, it's, it's a very, very long process. So it's like trying to publish a paper. Yeah, yeah. I um I also teach I teach a class called Creative Media Production for Scientists, and it's oh, a hundred wow. percent science grad students, and um, it's Amazing. it's a three credit hour class, and it's it's them, uh, making from start to finish a spend the entire semester making one piece of media about either their science or their research or whatever, and yeah, it's it's um. I feel like one of one of the things that I've learned by doing this myself is that it's it's learning a whole it's learning how to communicate in a whole different language. And there's so much you learn by doing. And like you said, like making short films and sort of iterations of a of a story is a thing. 
and it, it's a it's a it, you kind of learn about yourself in the process you learn yeah. like what how you can best tell a story yeah. and that seems to like dictate for me personally like dictate like what stories I want to focus on mm-hmm. and the more I make stuff the more I learn about what I can and can't do or both physically and and also just like you know performatively and and interest wise yeah. and I think you know for for working with students it's it's in science it's it's kind of like opening up a different side of their brain because you can't read a you can't read a protocol and like follow it and get a thing you have yeah. to like it's the experiential thing of like making it and like you learn by writing and writing in this case is like picking up a camera and shooting stuff or like just saying something to the camera and seeing what works, what doesn't, what can or can't you do. Mm-hmm. I don't, yeah, it's, it's sort of. It's, yeah, it's, and it's, it's interesting because th- th- there's also this realization that the, the documentation or the filming of something, there's something that's subjective, right? There's something that is ultimately you're telling, you know, even though you're capturing an experiment or you're, you're visualizing data, you're doing it through your own lens, you know, what, I mean, you're doing it through the camera lens, but you're also doing it through your own perspective. And I think that's sometimes hard for scientists to understand that it's okay for things to be subjective. You know, it, not, not everything, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to kind of drench this, you know, this documentation with like a, with, with a, with a very subjective view. And also the other thing is that you, you spend your day in laboratories using instruments that are all about visualizing, right? You spend your day with microscopes and doing simulations and recording um, and like painstaking observation, empirical observation that it just makes sense to have a camera. It's almost like your additional eye that, that documents things. It's just this idea of using that video to make art out of it is, is where, you know, um, or whether it's gonna be used for, for science communication or whether it can be used for other reasons. I think that's where scientists need to feel more comfortable in that, in that respect, that it's okay for the data to be used in other ways that were not initially intended to be used for so yeah it like it, it it like hurts my soul when i like read a scientific paper and i like dig into the supplementary figures or the and i see like an awesome piece of video but it's like buried in a supplemental like behind a paywall and no one will ever see it yeah. like it, that just hurts it's yeah. it's brutal it's changing it's brutal. though it's changing i mean at some point, I also wanted to use that idea of supplementary video as like a, we wanted to create a series, like use, yeah, mocking this idea of, you know, video being supplement, but, but I think it's slowly changing. And I, and I, you know, definitely it's very, very important to get scientists to, to be kind of their own architects on how they use their data and how they communicate it. Um, so, so yeah, this is all, this is all things that I, I teach and I'm, I'm interested in. I'm also interested in, you know, hybrid forms of storytelling that it's, you know, mixing documentary with fiction and, and not being afraid of, of, of incorporating different ways in which we communicate science. And I, you know, personally, lately in the last, like, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 years, science has been categor- has been kind of niched into this kind of, you know, either it's when you make, when you say that you make science films, it's like science documentary or it's science fiction, but there's such a gray zone of, uh, and, you know, let's not forget that the beginning of film was all about scientific observation. The early films that were ever made by the Lumiere brothers and by, you know, Percy Smith and all these early films in the 1900s were all about like the acrobatic fly, for example, speaking about flies, it's like one of the first films made of a, of a fly, you know, um, manipulating like, a cork in in the air and all these things. So, um, so I think there's a, there's an there's a necessity to to really make people realize that science cinema is is very rich and there's a lot of ways in which you can communicate it. So, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because I I so I know I know a bunch of people. Well, not a bunch, but a handful of people who, you know, got a PhD and and sort of are are now in in the art space. Um, and that path, like, it splits off into a bunch of different ways. Like, I know people who, you know, are now a successful, like, uh, producer directors in, like, the, the TV nature documentary sort of sphere of, of stuff. 
I know people who got it, got like a genetics PhD and then went into like YouTube, like yeah. science video land. Um, but I don't know very many people who took the path that you did, who, who went into like art, art house, independent, like cinema. Um, I, like, I, I wonder what, was that a choice or was that just sort of a, a reflection of your interests and, and sort of your, your, your things? And do you think, you know, if, if you're, if you're, you know, doing all this now, would you, would you take the same path? Yeah. I mean, I never, I never choose based on, you know, like trying to adhere to like a specific, I mean, I, I was always more compelled by fiction. I mean, I always felt that, that my work stemmed from documentary, that I needed to do a lot of research, which was ultimately documentary work, whether it was, you know, interviewing scientists, like, you know, I would, I could sit down with you, Adrian, and I could ask you about things. But then the idea was always to use that as a, as a blueprint to then construct stories around that. Um, and, and fiction is always something that, that, that I was compelled by. I don't know whether it's maybe I'm, you know, half French, half Venezuelan. I come from like a multicultural background. I always was really interested in this idea that science is um, the, the kind of the cultural aspects of science, like how science is done in different parts of the world or how science intersects with, um, with spiritualism or with different types of other, you know, you know in, in this case of the monarch butterfly, you know, I, I kind of mix Evo Devo research with, uh, with the Day of the Dead in Mexico, you know, and kind of bring in those worlds of evolutionary development with, with, um, with all kinds of, of, of practices in Mexico. And so that, you know, and then my films kind of became like these independent art house films, but that's also because I don't really have the means to make, um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like there's, there's, there's a need for more of that. Yeah, it's it's definitely a niche that is not filled. Um, a need for more of, of the style that, that you're making? Or yeah, that... more of kind of like independent, like, you know, kind of coming of age stories, stories that are about um, characters, people, um, not sensationalized, um, you know, just just human stories about scientists and about people. And, um, and so they tend to be these like independent art house movies because that's kind of how I, how I also build the financing, the interest, the investors, the, you know, I get research grants from universities. I get help from, you know, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Genetic Society of America and the World Wildlife Fund. These are the people that support me. And even though there's a little bit of resistance because they, they think of science film as being Discovery Channel and Nat Geo, that there's a little bit of explanation to be done, but that ultimately, uh, you know, they realize that it actually reaches a lot of people because it, it plays in cinemas and it plays in, in you know, it, it actually has like a pretty wide release um, to that extent. And what was interesting with the Fly Room is that it had that that kind of fly mania, which was amazing, like, you know, from, from Tokyo to, you know, to ba Bangalore and in India, like there was just like people were so happy that there was a movie made about fruit flies, which was remarkable. And PhD students would come up to me and ask me, how do I become a filmmaker? And, um, but then it also had like an interesting um, run in, you know, in, in, in like art house venues in Berlin and Paris and in, it played in Brooklyn. And so, so it's also kind of trying to break the, the molds that we've created about where these films should play. Um, but yeah, I'm very interested in the character of the scientist, you know, and also playing around with like, you know, you may not see this person as a scientist, but they are, you know, the, the, they, they are. And so my latest film is about a Mexican immigrant scientist in New York. And, you know, you would see him and you may not think that he's a scientist, but he's an evolutionary biologist and there are many like him that would identify. And so I'm very interested, especially with immigrants, um, immigrant scientists, because I'm an immigrant myself, to, to really kind of change the way we think about scientists on screen. So, and how they are as people, as parents, in the case of Fly Room, they can be, you can be the father of genetics, but you can, you can be a flawed father. You know, that's the whole irony of the film is he is the father of genetics, but he's not the greatest father. Yeah, yeah. I see a lot in your films, the, this idea of like, you know, a grand reason for doing biology or science is to try to to try to see ourselves and other organisms and try to learn 
you know, whether it's like a literal cure for cancer or aging or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, in, in Flyer, it's, it's that obsession that kind of drives, drives him to sort of lose himself or lose, you know, lose his, lose his daughter basically in, in search yeah. of himself and a fly. And I yeah. see that theme pop up again and again in, in your, in your work of, of, of what are the implications of like looking for ourselves and other, other organisms and, and Dude, what does right. that, and that You know, we always talk about model organisms as, a, as, you know, as it says, like a model organism, it's an organism to study human development disease, but in, as you said, it's also like a reflection of who we are and our fragilities and, and vulnerabilities. And so that's precisely it, is that, he, you know, ultimately Calvin, when he speaks to his daughter, he, he at some point opens up about his own childhood and his own upbringing. And, and you realize that he, he's, he's in this world because he's trying to understand himself and understand behavior. And there's also an interesting line that he has in the speakeasy where he says, soon we'll be able to understand behavior. You know, um, and of course, we're doing that now, and you know, the, you know, the whole field of epigenetics, and but, um, but yeah, that that is something that is is really important to me. Is like, why do we why do we become scientists? You know, and what what are the reasons behind it? It's, it's more than just a passion. It's we want to understand who we are and why we exist, and um, and I think that that's also important for people that get into the fields of of, of science, and so. Yeah, that, that, was, that was definitely, you know, and then Betsy actually became an artist because her father taught her how to, how to draw, actually. Mm -hmm. um, she learned how to draw flies and then she became a, you know, she became a fashion artist, like she, would, she worked for Macy's. And so that's remarkable. And she went to art school with the Nobel Prize money of, of her father. The other thing that I, was really important for me is to never at any point mention at the beginning of the film that the, the room that we were in had any significance. I didn't want people to know starting the film that the, I mean, some people would know because you're a scientist and you know about the fly room, but I just wanted it to be like an ordinary workplace right. and to reveal that at the end because I, I didn't want to overemphasize discovery. I just, I wanted it to be more about, you know, about them. And at the end in the credits, you know, to say, oh, and by the way, you just experienced a day in the laboratory where you know, the fundamental laws of genetics were, were, were discovered, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it works great. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's yeah it, I mean, it's not, it's, I, one, of the, one of the things that it does that, that you just don't see is, is getting at like the human motivations be, behind science and, and, you know, what that produces in terms of like the lives of those people and, and what, are the, what are the sort of effects of that. Um, because I, I think, think, I think the, um, just so like, you know, I, th I think that one of the issues is that a lot of science films, they focus a lot on discovery. Yeah. And there's also a lot of sensationalism, you know, like a film, you know, and these are not bad films because I enjoy them, but like the imitation game and um, the theory, there's something about overemphasizing discovery, which, you know, I understand that there's an importance to talk about scientific discoveries because that's, that's important, but it's over overly dramatized like the it just feels it feels like a, in a way like a caricature of their lives and, and so that's that's precisely what i'm trying to go against is is to show that these people are scientists but they could they could also be you know they could also be accountants it doesn't really matter ultimately it's it's about human beings basically they're they're human beings like everybody else they're not on a pedestal, they're not so different. They go home, they have families, they have marital problems, you know, they face racism, you know, they, they're yeah. fragile like everybody else. And I think that's really important is to really show hu humans as scientists so that people can relate to them and, and become them, be inspired to become like, like them, so. Yeah, um, can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I think about discovery, like, um, just building off of that, that I discovery is is interesting because um, you know I I like I said I I work on insect behavior and sort of descriptive natural history stuff with insects and like a lot of stuff that I discover is just it it doesn't matter like I, it's a discovery but like there's it's a discovery because literally no one cares about it yeah. so like it might have been it might be filming something for the first time or describing something for the first time but like just because no one's cared about it. 
So it like has this discovery element, but also has like, why am I doing it in the first place? Cause like anybody could have done this thing. It's like in my backyard, but, yeah. but I'm, you know, so, you know, I see these, I see, you know, science media as like, yeah, like touting the discovery of a new thing that's like going to change everybody's life. And, and it's just, just ultimate thing. But then in my own world, it's like, I did a discovery, but like, ultimately like nobody cares. And now it's my job to make people like have some percentage of, of yeah. caring about it. Um, but at the same time, it kind of, I'm telling my own story about like why I did this weird thing, yeah. you know? And yeah, I see it. Yeah. So I, I, I think about that all the time too. Yeah. It's interesting because I feel like also in the time of the fly room, there's, there was an understanding that scientists were also part of the discourse of like the, you know, the art movements. And there was just more of a, this intermingling between those communities. And there was more of conversations between philosophers and artists and, and activists. And so that, that's something that I also, what was interesting about making it was that revival of that, of that spirit, you know, to, to really kind of engage and it, especially now with, with this pandemic, I feel like scientists should really, um, and they are doing it to some extent, should, are really the, the, the celebrities, the people that really are, you know, that we should be listening to and, and, and putting in the forefront. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all interesting. You know, I, my, my sense is always to never discard how certain things are done. It's just like amplifying or aggregating other ways in which it's done, basically. I would never say, oh, you know, like the Alan Turin film is terrible or, you know, of course I love Gattaca and all these films. I, I think those are inherently amazing films. And that's also partly why I went into creating a film festival was because I wanted to embrace this idea that there are many ways of telling um, scientific stories that are that that are not just getting the attention that they deserve. And so that was that was the other side of my kind of activism was I'm going to make films and I'm also going to cheer cheerlead other films that are being made. And um, so that's you know that's just kind of like the the other side of the coin basically. Yeah, and, and since you're on your 13th year of that, I, have you seen like an uptick in submissions that you get that aren't from traditional filmmakers that are- Oh my God, from, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, most of the films are from, I would say like 25% are from maybe scientists, but most of them are from, you know, filmmakers from all around the world. We, we received this year around 5,000 submissions. So Wow, that's, wow. And we selected about uh, 80 films, um, and this year, because it's going to be online, because of everything that's happening, we, we, we have many more features. And yeah, it's, it's going to be great. And we, we created this platform, the labocina.com, uh, where the festival is going to be hosted on. And um, yeah, and it's been a really great platform to host conversations with, you know, with filmmakers and scientists. And we have this initiative called Scenes, which is all about exactly what you were mentioning about creating an open source database for scientific videos. Um, so yeah, that's all kind of, there's definitely been a lot of interest, especially from, from established filmmakers to be in a science festival. They feel so honored, you know, to, to have been kind of vetted as being like, you know, they sometimes also will say, oh, but my film is not science. And I'll be like, well, we think it is, you know. So, so that's also interesting is, the conversation about what is a science film, uh, which we've had many times over the years. Um, you know, the festival happens in New York and it also happens in, in, we do like satellite festivals, but we often have that conversation about what is a science film? Um, how do you define what a science film is? And do you define it based on the qualities of the film, how it's received, who makes it? I mean, there are many, there are many ways in which you can define, you know, those terms, so. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so maybe I should look in the chat and see if there's any questions. Yeah, I was also looking as well. Um, well, I'll remind everybody, uh, I'll give you two a, a quick break just to remind everybody that they can pose their thoughts, questions in the chat, anything you want to know about. Um, as you were talking, there were some things that I was curious about, so I can throw my questions at you too. Uh, given that, you know, you've both been practicing scientists or currently are, um, but have also found your way into video and filmmaking. How do you think the, 
the process for training scientists can or should change, if it can at all, to incorporate these uh, visual design techniques, you know, innovative video, film, uh, or public speaking, right? There's so many ways that people can learn to do communication. How can a training scientist gain those skills on top of the skills that they need to do their professional work in research? Adrian, you want to, you want to take that first? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, well, Alexi, you have a whole program of like, isn't your symbiosis? Uh, yes. Yeah. Symbiosis. yeah. But I mean, my short answer is, is so, I, I mean, when I was a grad student, I secretly took a night class at a community college that was like film, film the one-on-one class for their film school. It was at Scottsdale Community College. And all, all it did for me really was like give me permission to like do it. Like they taught, they taught like um, a nonlinear si like editing system, Avid. And I was like, oh, so that's how they like cut, you know, digital film and, and do that. And that's, that's all I needed. And then it was like permission to practice and permission to do it and like just a baseline fundamental thing. And then, it, you know, as I progress, it's, it's, it's g being able to give the language to define it as part of what I do as a scientist and part of my scholarship. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's the other important thing. Um, so it's like, you know, I, I kind of, kind of need a little bit of based on knowledge. Someone needs to tell you it's okay to be bad. Just do it and learn by doing and then also think about the why of why people are doing it. And that's kind of what I try to teach students myself is like, you know, I can show you so much, but you have to, it's a, it's, you have to learn about it yourself. And I'm here to tell you that just doing it and, 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 and practice is going to get you so far in, in it. Um, and here's some, here's some reasons why, but you have to also define the why for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, yeah, I agree with what Adrian said. I mean, I think that one of one of the important things is is to realize that video is not just a tool to um, to communicate. I mean, as we were saying before, it's not only a tool to communicate or or something that's like a hobby or leisure, but it's really it's really exercising another way in which you're actually com you're actually harnessing the data that you're working on. And I think every scientist should be equipped with the ability of really understanding how how to create video. The way I think it should happen is it should happen relatively early in the process of becoming a researcher. So we have this program at the festival called Symbiosis where we pair PhD students with, uh, with filmmakers and they exchange ideas on how to make films around different scientific topics. And the filmmaker will come with their own ideas and the scientists will come in with, with their own, but they're both actually creating the content together. Um, and I think that those, those types of collaborations and and just not thinking of it as like an add-on, you know, oh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do some video on the side because I think it's like fun to do, but really understand that it's critical um, to becoming a scientist, to engage others, to train, to communicate, all, all, of, all of those things. Um, and so I think there needs to be more of that. Um, and in the, in the film world, I think they're just, you know, film is ultimately just a tool. So more interdisciplinarity in terms of how films are made and, and more kind of, you know, moment like contact points between filmmakers and other disciplines. I think when you're in a film school, it's very insular. You know, you're in this like, you know, you're in this like school and it's like, you know, you're in the school where Scorsese went and all of it, there's like a whole like image around the school, but there needs to be more interfaces with other departments, the science department, the social sciences and anthropology department. And those are gonna, those, those are the things that are gonna make filmmakers um, compelling um, storytellers is to be able to communicate with those people from other disciplines. So I think there, there needs to be work on both ends. So. Do you have any tips for people to get projects out of their brains and into the real world for creating? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I, I always think that, you know, you need to start filming. I mean, I, I'm constantly filming, you know, by myself, whether it's with my phone or I have like a microscope at home and I film stuff. And so I think my advice is to, to make, to do a pro like film something, but finish it and show it, like go through all the stages of, of making it 
and presenting it and talking about it. Um, that if, it, if it's left unfinished, which is also fine, but you will, you will never understand the whole process of how people respond to it, how people interact with it, where, where does it end up playing? Like for example, the fly room being part of the Buckfest is great because it's a, I'm also tailoring the way I speak about it in relation to, to the festival, right? So if I were speaking at, you know, at another event, it would be a different maybe angle to that. So I think it's really important to, um, to showcase your work and, and whether it's in a gallery setting, in a festival, online, I mean, that's really a big part of, of projects. And so I think, don't be afraid to just, I mean, many films are made with, you know, with nothing. So I might, the first film that I made for Fly New York was just with like a small camera, so. But how did you get that last shot at the end where it's like, where it's floating above the bridge? Is it hooked up to a balloon? Uh, that's, no, that's... In, in the middle of New York City, there's a, there's a tram, it's called the Roosevelt, the Roosevelt Tramway. Uh-huh. Um, it's an amazing, yeah. And it's actually was my view from my, like my, my bench during my PhD. I, because the Rockefeller is in Midtown and the Roosevelt tramway passes, goes from Roosevelt Island and arrives in Midtown. And I took it one day and I filmed from it. And oh. I, that was, that's the shot. Okay. And actually in my last film, you know, the Monarch Butterfly, I have a shot of New York City. Of course there I'm with like this really crazy Alexa mini camera. Um, and we're filming with like a crew of five and we're getting these like, you know, steady cam shot of the, and I, I remembered that the first time I had shot there was, you know, this like fruit fly in New York with like a mini TV camcorder. And I, and it was interesting because that's part of what Chris's question is. I went back to that spot because I remembered, oh, this is where, you know, this is where I got the shot and this is where I'm going to come back and do it. And, and again, I, I've shown the film, we've had a few test screeners and, um, and people ask me like, how did you get that shot of New York city? And it's, you know, it was, it was from the same tram. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's Before really cool. COVID. Before COVID, yeah. Do you, do you have an idea of when Son of Mar Monarchs is, is going to be out? Yeah. So, so we've been debating a lot about the whole online and, you know, you know, we were hoping for like a theatrical, but basically it's going to play in where the butterfly sanctuaries are in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to play in a big festival there called Morelia. And so Morelia is where we sh near where we shot in, in Michoacan. And, um, and then from there we may go, you know, we're still waiting to hear back from Sundance and other ones, but we thought it was really important to show it in where the monarch butterflies, you know, where they migrate to every year. So um, yeah, it's re I'm really excited. We're, the film is gonna play there at the end of October. So pretty soon. Wow, cool. And then we'll, you'll start hearing about it because we'll, we, we release it to the world and it'll have, you know, other screenings will happen. And hopefully we'll have something in, in person right now. right now. Right now we're in color correction in Paris. So I spend my days in studios, um, you know, altering the color of butterfly wings. And it's an ama amazing process of adjusting the color on the film, so. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, uh, thanks so much for, for yeah. doing this with us. And it was really great to talk to you. And I'm really excited to see uh, Son of Monarchs whenever, whenever it comes out. Yeah, um, thanks so much for having me, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Chris and Carrie and all the, all the audience members out there. If anybody wants to know more about the film or, you know, or the, fest the festival is called Imagine Science Films, Imagine Science Film Festival, and it's imaginesciencefilms.org is, uh, is the website. I can write it here if you guys want. But that, that's going to be in exactly, um, in exactly a month from now. So. Excellent, excellent stuff. And uh, so we've got that. We've got Lava Cine. Uh, Adrian, how can people find you? Uh, you can just come to the museum whenever it's open. <laughs> hey, September <laughs> or, 22nd. Or YouTube slash Ant Lab or like any social media stuff. Yeah, I have to say, Adrian, I love your Ant films and we should definitely show, show those at the festival stuff. So. Oh, thanks. Awesome. Yeah. They're really beautiful, yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, well, since you mentioned Adrian, I'll let everybody watching know. Museum re uh, opens back to the public September 22nd, next Tuesday, 10 a.m. You can go to naturalsciences.org and get a free timed reservation to visit the museum again. 
We've got everything ready for you. We're excited to welcome people into our doors. If you're enjoying BugFest, make sure you check out bugfest.org where you can see more programs that are coming up today, tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday. All kinds of great stuff happening. And since we, BugFest is all virtual this year, we're doing pre-orders for the oh-so-popular BugFest t-shirts, which means you can get it in a rainbow of colors. So check out bugfest.org. Also, if you join the museum as a member or renew your membership, you can get one of these dazzling t-shirts for free. And of course, the museum appreciates your support in that way. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors for BugFest this year, BASF and Terminex for being with us. And we'll see you at the next BugFest program. Adrian, Alexi, again, thank you so very much. What an awesome conversation. Thank you. Thank you so All much. Right. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.